Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, Pastor Pete Bunnell delivers us a tithing challenge based on Scripture in Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. You can grab the life notes from our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Peter Bunnell. You can have a seat. I am so glad to see you all here today. And um, you can see my uh, title. Well, let's see. Let's put the title up there. The title for today is The Tithing Challenge. The Tithing Challenge. And I'm really thankful that I don't see masses of people getting up and walking away when you see that title. Because if you've been around the church world for a while, you know that this is a sermon about money. And if you're new to the whole church thing, you're probably looking at that and going, what does tithing mean? What is that word? I don't, I don't ever hear that word. And that's cool because we don't talk about it that much here at Calvary. We don't typically pl- pass an offering plate uh, in the middle of our service during a song. Um, we talk more about generosity, right? And seeking to be generous to our community. That's why we're giving out Thanksgiving gift cards today for those who need a little help to have a good Thanksgiving. That's why we're collecting gifts gifts and backpacks to go to Mexico and to go down to the reservation because we like to talk a lot about generosity and being generous and a giving church. So we don't talk much about tithing. But today is the day that we are going to get to talk about it. Um, And I'm going to define that word for those of you who are wondering what does tithing mean. I'll be defining that in just a minute. But before we get started, I want to give just a few disclaimers Um, The first is, if this is your first time here, I am so glad that you're here. We're glad to have you as a guest. I'm hoping that you're enjoying the worship and the experience of being in this room and worshiping the Lord. And I just want to let you know that some of the challenges that we're going to hear about in the passage today are specifically geared towards those who call Calvary their home church. Right? So there's going to be some things you hear, and just as our guest, uh, I'm not really addressing those parts to you. But um, there will definitely be challenges and things you can take away from the message today. And if you're here because you're seeking God, you have questions about who God is, what he's like, you're going to hear that today. You're going to hear some about God's character and how he wants to relate to his people and how he wants his people to respond to them. And I hope that you are blessed by what you learn about God today. I also preach this sermon realizing that we are in a time of economic uncertainty, right? We all feel the rise in gas prices, rent prices, utility, food prices. We all feel that and experience that. And so As we talk about money and we talk about tithing, I realize that that's the reality we live in. And what's more, God realizes it, and he cares about it, and he knows it. Um, And then the the next thing I just want to remind us of is we have to approach this topic of tithing with the mindset that Pastor Chad brought us when he kicked off the generosity challenge the first weekend in November, right? He gave us a few key, key truths that we need to remember. First off, God doesn't need our money. And he said that God doesn't need our money because God owns everything. Everything is his. So he doesn't need our money. Uh, We also talked about the fact that the church doesn't need your money because the church is the bride of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, Jesus is going to take care of his church. But in that reality, there was also shared the fact that we need to give. We need to be generous because that's how God created us to be, as his image bearers. And as we are generous, God blesses us. So with those disclaimers, I have no idea if it's a good idea to start a sermon with four disclaimers. I don't know if that's a good idea, but I did it anyways. But with those those things as our background, we're gonna look at Malachi chapter three today. So if you're using your Bible app, you can open to Malachi three. If you're using a Bible, that's the last book in the Old Testament. The Bible's here in the room. It's on page 954. So Malachi chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I'll give you a little background. This is a prophetic book written to the nation of Israel 
um, way before Jesus was on the scene. And uh, as a prophetic book, it is calling out people's sin. Specifically, it's calling out the sin of Israel, God's chosen people. And what's interesting, right before verse 6, where we're going to start, in verse 5, God tells the Israelites that they've been sinning in some pretty serious ways. Um, they have been practicing sorcery. They've been practicing adultery. They had been lying and bearing false witness, and they had been oppressing, oppressing the poor. So right after God says, hey, you're guilty of these things, we come to verse 6. So I'm going to read it for us here. Verse 6 in Malachi 3. I'm going all the way to verse 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. So what is the Bible asking us to do? Well, the Bible is asking us to return to God because he hasn't moved. Return to God because he hasn't moved. This is one of the great theological truths about God is that God does not change. Theologians like to call that um, that he is immutable without mutation. God doesn't change. Who God is stays consistent throughout the decades, throughout the millennium, throughout the centuries. God doesn't change. What he was yesterday, he is now, and he will be tomorrow. I kind of think of this like coming home, right? When you've been on a long trip, you've been traveling, you've been in hotel rooms, you've been on the road, and you get to come home, usually that is a great feeling. It's like I can't wait to get home where I know where everything is. I can't wait to be home where I can rest and get a good night's sleep. Returning to God is like coming home to exactly what you expect because God doesn't change. The other beautiful thing in this passage is that it talks about God continually showing grace to his people. You see, God had chosen the nation of Israel and made a covenant with them. He made an agreement with them and they were supposed to follow this agreement and obey God's word. They didn't do such a great job. It says here in the passage that basically from the beginning they'd been failing to follow God. But what does it say? It says they were not consumed. Despite their disobedience, God didn't destroy them. He was faithful and he continually offered grace to his people. Today, God offers a new covenant with us with those in this room. It's a covenant with Jesus. It's a covenant of grace that we enter into by faith. When we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we get to be brought into God's family. Most of us in this room are not children of Jacob. We don't descend genetically from Israel, but we are still God's children through adoption, through faith in Jesus Christ. We get to be called God's children. And so that same grace that God had so long ago continues on us today because of Jesus Christ. So if you're in this room today and you're thinking to yourself, 
I don't know if I'm in that grace. I don't know if I can be called a child of God and inheriting that blessing through Jesus. You can trust in Jesus right now. It is a free offer, a free opportunity to put your faith in Christ, to trust what he did on the cross and in his resurrection and then be adopted into God's family and have that promise that because God doesn't change, you are not consumed. Today is a day for you to come to Christ if you've never done that. Now, if you're here and you have come to Christ in the past, but you've walked away from him, maybe there's been decades, years, where you haven't followed Christ and you haven't walked with him closely and you haven't lived out that faith. What is the invitation here? Return to me and I will return to you. He's ready to love you. He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to walk with you through a new phase of life. So return to Christ again if you have wandered away from him. I love this passage because it's kind of like a conversation between God and the people, right? God says something and then there's this question that the people ask. So after God says, return to me and I will return to you, the people ask, how shall we return? How shall we return? And the answer is by stop robbing God because robbing God is not a good idea. That's pretty obvious, right? Robbing God is just not a good idea. It's like uh, the plot to one of the worst heist movies ever. You know those heist movies where you get a group of people and they're gonna break in some place that's impenetrable against some massively powerful person? Well, in this case, the people are saying, I've got a great idea. Let's rob from the most all-knowing, all-powerful um, person who can send us to an eternal punishment or reward us eternally. Let's rob from him. Anybody here wanna join that team? No, there's a few of you that didn't answer, so I guess you're contemplating it. We would never want to join this heist team. How many of you in here have been robbed? In the past, you have experienced being robbed. Yeah. Okay, it sucks, if I can say that during a sermon. When, 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 I, was, when I was a kid, we went on vacation, and within 15 minutes of us leaving our house, someone broke in and they stole our VCR. Now you're like, who cares? It's a VCR. But back, back in those days, how else was I gonna watch Disney classics on VHS, okay? And, and it, it makes you feel fearful. It makes you feel like you've been wronged. And even as a kid, I caught that because it, it was really only 15 minutes after we left on vacation because our house sitter came in right after we left and the door was open and the VCR was missing. And so, you know, it's like, man, someone's been watching us. They were staking us out. They knew what we were doing and they were ready to come in. And we only got a VCR stolen probably because the house sitter showed up. When you get robbed, there is this sense of injustice and it's righteous injustice because what was yours was taken. So when God is being robbed, if God is being robbed, you can believe that he's not going to accept that. In righteous anger, he will resist the people who are robbing him. He will work against them. And the point of that working against them is to bring them to repentance. Robbing God in this case, it says, had brought a curse on the people and on the nation simply because robbing God is not a good idea. So the next question that they asked is, how have we robbed you? How have we robbed you, God? And he says, by not bringing the full tithe to God. Did you catch that? Not bringing the full tithe to God? They were bringing something. It just wasn't everything that God had asked for. So what is a tithe? So a tithe is a tenth. It's 10%. It's one-tenth of what had grown for them. They were an agricultural community. It was one-tenth of what they had raised from their livestock. It was 10% of what they could barter and trade for. 10% was basically the minimum expected contribution from the people in Israel. 
there were other offerings and contributions and thanksgiving offerings and offerings for the poor that God asked for the people to give. But the tithe was the basic beginning amount. If you remember uh, at the beginning of November, Pastor Chad gave the generosity challenge, right? And he brought up the bowls of ice cream, right? And the bowls represented the generosity and what could get put in the bowls represented the blessings from God, right? The ice cream that could get put in. That small bowl is like the tithe. That small bowl is the starting point. And then generosity grows from there. The tithe is something that Israel was expected to do. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Pete, this is my money. I worked for it, I earned it, I saved it. Why would it be considered robbing? Because everything we have belongs to God. 100% of what we have is his. The Bible says that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The modern day version of it is he owns the dollars in a billion banks. The world and everything in it is the Lord's. So our entire bank account, our entire paycheck, our entire pension is 100% his. So here's the beauty of it though. He has given it to us as stewards. We're managers. And what he has done is he said, hey, you're going to manage this money. I'm going to give it to you. And here's how I want you to manage it. The first 10% I want you to give to me. And then the 90%, I'm going to give you a lot of freedom in how you use it for me, for the ways that I want you to use it, right? So, you know, from that 90%, God says, you know, you better have some food and you better have some clothes and it would be really great if you had some shelter. And it would be really good if you had some time to rest. So use that 90% as you see fit to accomplish all the other things that God wants you to do with that. Right? So we start out with that 10%. God says, this is your offering to me, your tithe. And then this other 90%, it's still God's. But you get the freedom on how you want to use it to accomplish God's purposes in your life. Now, in this passage, uh, Malachi makes it really clear that they were all robbing God. It was a sin that the whole nation was committing. The whole nation was robbing God. Are we guilty today? Christians today give about 2.5% of their income, according to statistics. 2.5%, that's kind of the, the average. In the Great Depression, it was 3.3%. So as we've gotten more affluent, we have given less. Church-going families that make over 75,000 a year, 1% of them give at least a tithe or more. So of those families that are making over 75,000, only 1% are doing the tithe. Now that's, a, that's across all churches. Lifeway Research has done research into churches that are more like Calvary, right? Bible-believing evangelical churches. And what they found in those churches was that three out of four churchgoers believed in the tithe as being biblical. So that makes me feel good. There's about 75% of you that you're just like, yeah, I totally agree with you, Pete. That's, that's good. Tithing is biblical. Um, of that 75, according to Lifeway, 51% are actually following through on it, right? They're following through on the tithe. 2% say they don't give at all. And then there's all a spectrum after that. So based on the statistics, I know that this is hard. I know that this is a challenge. I know that this is not very easy to do. But I still think the call to us is the same. We need to stop robbing God. And what will happen if we stop robbing God? 
Well, the results of tithing are good. And I think that's why the next part of this passage just moves into all the blessings when people do tithe and they do put that first in their budget. Verse 10, when God's people tithe, God's temple has full storehouses. So again, an agricultural community, they're bringing in the first fruits into the temple, right? So the storehouses would be full for the temple. They would be able to serve each other. They would be able to keep the ministry of the temple going. They would be able to take care of their priests and the Levites who worked in the temple, and they would be able to reach the world their storehouses would be full. Calvary practices a type of tithing. Of all the donations we get, 18% go to missions, right? We don't spend them on ourselves. It doesn't go to staffing costs. It doesn't go to electricity. It doesn't go to the facility costs. It goes out. It goes out to the community and it goes out to the world. It's 18% this year. Our hope is that it will be 20% next year. Calvary practices tithing so we can influence the world. When the finances of the church are strong, then ministry can go forward and can expand. That's how we have a building. That's how we have ministry. That's how we hire staff. That's how we buy curriculum. That's how we do outreach into our community. When the church is funded, then there's more missions and there's more things like the gift cards that we're gonna give out today to bless our community. Verse 12 also states one of the good results of tithing that the nations will realize that God is blessing his people. So, so tithing is missional because it causes God's fame to spread to other regions, to people who don't know him. And the world will look and will say, God is working in his people because tithing leads to expansion of the kingdom and it leads to outreach. And there's also a personal blessing. It's not just a ministry blessing, but in verse 11, you see that there is a personal blessing that comes from tithing. God pours out his blessings and eliminates the need that we feel. See, God is reprimanding Israel for their lack of giving in the midst of their need. Did you see that in verse 11? Right at the end of verse 11. He will pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So he's talking to people that are experiencing need and he says, tithe, and I'm gonna bless you so you don't experience that need any longer. You're in need because you're not obeying me. If you obey me, I will eliminate the need that you're experiencing. The other thing that's interesting about this passage is that it says God invites us to test him. We can test him in this and see if he is faithful. This is one of the only areas where you get this kind of invitation from God, where he says, hey, try it out. Test me and see if it works. See if I won't bless you and fill that need. I'm gonna share with you a testimony right now from Rick Paxton. Rick is one of our Yoke Fellows here. He's a member of our congregation. He's heading to be a deacon at the church. And I want you to hear his tithing testimony. Watch the video. Hi. My name is Rick Paxton, and I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'd like to talk to you about my experience with tithing. I've been going to Calvary for 10 years. Before that, I had never gone to church. Four years ago, I went out to lunch with Pastor Chad. I got transparent and honest with him and told him that I'd never tithed in my life. I told him that I didn't think I could ever afford to do so since I had a fixed income. I was forced to retire 10 years ago because of health problems. Pastor Chad informed me that it's the only place in the Bible where God says to test you. In Malachi chapter 3, it states, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I thought Pastor Chad was nuts. There's no way that the Lord wants to bless me financially, but I hesitantly agreed to do so. I did it for three months, as he suggested, 5% of my income. At my surprise, I had more money in the bank than I did when I started. I don't know how God did it, but he did. 
So I, I decided to tithe even more. I did it for several months and realized that the Lord was, had kept blessing me more and more. I decided to go all in with the 10%. To my surprise, the Lord blessed me so much that I even decided to give to charity. Today, I know that the Lord blesses you. I believe in God's word. I continue to tithe on a regular basis and give to charity. I want to challenge you to test God, as it says, says in the Bible, and do what I do. I'll guarantee it, He will bless you. Thank you. You know, I just want to say, well, one, thank you, Rick, for being willing to share that. And I just want to concur with that testimony. Um, if I stand up here and preach this and I can't say that I've done that, I I've been tithing for 30 years. And in 30 years, I have never, ever seen God lack faithfulness or leave me or my family in need. So some of you in this room are going to have to be creative to figure out what it means to tithe. Some of you are married to a spouse who will refuse to give money to the church. That's a difficult situation. Some of you have zero income. You don't have anything coming in to tithe on. Um, some of you have so much indebtedness that your wages are garnished before you ever see them. In all of those difficult situations, I want to just encourage you, not, not just walk away and say, oh, this doesn't apply to me, but just to say, God, lead me in this. W what is it that I need to do? How do I obey you in this situation? And work that out with God. But for most of us in this room, um, we have some form of income. And most of us have a great deal of freedom in how we spend it. And we need to return to God by obeying him and adopting the tithe. So if the tithe is good, um, let me give you a few tips on how to tithe or maybe how not to tithe. Here are some quick tips on how not to tithe. Okay, number one, don't tithe legalistically. Don't be legalistic about it, like this is what I've got to do in order for God to be happy with me and for me to be right with God. Uh, that's what the Pharisees did, right? And God condemns them in Matthew 23 and in Luke 18, saying you do the tithe, but you neglect the more important things. So don't do this legalistically. Next, don't do it grumbling. Don't, God loves a cheerful giver, right? Each one must give as as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, God loves a cheerful giver. So that's not saying that if you can't be cheerful, you shouldn't do it. It's better to obey grumpy than to not obey at all. But while you're obeying, seek for God to give you joy in what you get to do and what you get to be a part of. Don't tithe by giving haphazardly. Don't be haphazard about it. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. So this is idea of being intentional with your tithing. Don't tithe from the leftovers. Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy 26 all point to the fact that this was from the first fruits. When they tithed, it was from the first fruits. It wasn't from the leftovers. And what's interesting is when Jesus commends people's giving, he commends the people that have given everything. Think about the widow who puts in the last two mites that she has. Everyone else was giving out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. She gave everything. And God said she gave more than the rest. And finally, don't tithe to show off. Right, we're not about this to show off. We don't need to let everyone know how much we're donating online or how much we're putting in those offering boxes. Ananias and Sapphira, when they brought their offering in the book of Acts chapter five and they bragged about it, they died in church that day. Okay, so we don't wanna show off when we come to tithing. We wanna do it privately. So Calvary, it is time possibly for some of you to return to God specifically in the area of tithing. To put him first in your life, which means putting him first in your finances. And you know what God promises. He's gonna transform your finances. He will bless, and he will bless us in the best ways possible. 
So this week, let me encourage you, spend some time prayerfully looking over your budget, looking over your pay stub, and either jump in with both feet and just start tithing, or maybe if you're afraid to do that, start with progressive tithing. Do what Rick did and start with 5% and go up from there if this is a new concept for you. There's a promise of blessing for your church and a promise of blessing for your life when you tithe. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have uh, blessed us so much in Christ Jesus already. Your word promises that you have blessed us with um, every spiritual blessings within the realm of heaven because of Jesus Christ. So we come to this just wanting to reflect the generosity you've given us in Jesus. We come to this just wanting to be able to obey you. And we confess right now that this is hard. This is not easy. But we know that you can strengthen us. We know that you can bless us in the midst of this. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus says, I will pour out the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You see, tithing is the only topic in the Bible where Jesus challenges us to test him. So what are you waiting for? Test what he says by giving the first 10% of your income back to him through your church. If Calvary is your church, you can test him right now by going to calvaryaz.com forward slash give. Many people experience miraculous blessings when they trust Jesus with their finances and practice tithing. If you have a similar situation, I'd like to hear about it. Shoot us an email at questions at calvaryaz.com and let us know how the Lord has blessed you. That will do it for today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.